Okay, aging urine, we're, I'm gonna call that hydrolyzed urine. That's a urine that's undergone hydrolysis. You can see the pH shift there, the fresh from 6.2 all the way up to 9.1. Again, this is using those German figures. Notice something else that's going on here. Like, take a look at the phosphorus. Uh, where did that phosphorus go? Where did that potassium go? What happened to all of our calcium and magnesium? What is kind of interesting here is um, as ammonia sits and the pH shifts up, or as urine sits and the pH shifts up, uh, some of these minerals actually uh, drop out. They're no longer soluble in a high pH environment. Um, so your calcium, your magnesium, uh, most of your phosphorus, and, and again, some of your potassium. Actually, some of your nitrogen is going to drop out too, um, probably. And um, uh, what you'll see is that these minerals, this, this sludge will build up in the bottom of your containers. Now, this is a real big problem for the urine diversion folks who are advocating, um, uh, you know, a community-wide urine collection. So they've got these really large urine containers and, and piping systems. And this, this sludge eventually clogs up and builds around the outside of these pipes. Wastewater treatment professionals know all about it. But for us, it's actually pretty cool, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, this, this material is, is known as struvite. Now, struvite isn't all of it, but it's some of it. It's basically a mineral form of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate. There's also another sediment called apatite, I believe I'm saying that right, which is uh, some of your calcium. But this happens when all of the magnesium in your urine and calcium in your phosphate, your phosphorus, are no longer soluble, and they react with water, and they precipitate out. Uh, what's neat about this is it's actually, if you think about it, um, it's a solid, nutrient-dense fertilizer from urine uh, that is, is valuable. Um, it's valuable enough that you can package it and ship it and, and cover those shipping expenses. That's a big problem with urine now is that, um, you know, moving all of that liquid around really is an expensive way to, uh, to transport. It's an expensive way to fertilize if you're not close to your, to your fields. Um, what I found really profound about struvite, um, and there's a really uh, interesting um, work that was done. I, I don't recall who did it, but there's a big struvite project I read about in Nepal uh, where local mores really prevent them from using urine directly in their garden. They just don't want to do it. But struvite, they found uh, this, this mineral form of urine um, is acceptable for them. And they've actually taken this small village in Nepal and produced uh, struvite and, and been able to ship it out. So they're actually generating income out of their community, making struvite. Well, I just uh, couldn't stop there and had to make it on my own. So uh, right here is my little jar of struvite that I made. I forget how much urine this is. It was, this was a long time ago. Um, but I made struvite by adding, I, I tried to make it a number of different ways. But really what you have to do is, is introduce a um, magnesium source. What you're going to find is that even you know, the magnesium in your urine is going to bind with your phosphate ions, and it's going to precipitate out. And there's not enough magnesium in your urine to completely bind with all of your phosphorus. So when you make struvite, you need to add magnesium. And uh, there's a number of different places you can get magnesium. I used magnesium oxide that I just bought online. Uh, I wanted to get, you know, as close to uh, uh, stoichiometry, uh, 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 really just the perfect um, ratio here. This stuff is dusty, and it still smells like urine. Uh, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, so I use magnesium oxide. You can also use uh, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Um, uh, something pretty cool uh, that I came across was um, maybe the, the best thing to use is seawater brine after sodium chloride is taken out. They call that bittern, and um, it's very magnesium rich, and um, uh, that, that's been touted as a low-cost way to use magnesium and urine and make a, or to use this bittern and, 
and, uh, and precipitate out more minerals from that. It really essentially cleaning that water further too. Interesting opportunities with biochar here too. Imagine a uh, magnesium dope biochar and then urinating on that biochar. And now you're really pulling in chemically, you're pulling in and you're, you're taking more phosphorus out of your urine. You're guaranteed binding up all that phosphorus in your urine. Uh, imagine a, maybe a biochar soaked in bittern, like seawater with the sodium chloride taken out. Imagine how mineral rich that must be. Okay, just a little bit about handling and storage. We're going to take a break here pretty soon. Um, uh, and this is what I like to do. Um, remember I told you about closed containers. I, um, this is what I do for my morning urine. Uh, I, I, I'm going to uh, confess here. I don't know if my wife is watching, but she doesn't even know what I do. <laughs> how I collect it. But I have my means and my ways of collecting my morning urine. And I'm using these old laundry detergent bottles. These are pretty cool because, for one, they have a wide mouth. If you take the laundry detergent bottle, most of them you can pop out the little plastic spout. And uh, these are almost, uh, almost a gallon um, to the top. So I don't go all the way to the top because I don't want to spill. But if I'm just maybe an inch or two above the top, then I, I can measure these out in single gallon increments, um, which makes it nice later for dilution. Um, yeah, I've got kids at home. We're doing laundry all the time. I've got, got a dozen of these easily. Um, uh, either way, whatever you do, store in closed containers. Um, of course, minimize the handling for your own good, for your own nose. Um, wash your hands. And again, potential pathogens are, are killed in storage over time. Remember, um, remember your urine, is, it comes out acidic and it gradually becomes more alkaline over time. And uh, that's been shown to kill bacteria pretty quickly. Um, one thing that has not been shown uh, just on its own is, uh, is virus kill. So if this is something we're concerned about, um, Swedish research has indicated that uh, viruses actually take time and warm temperatures to kill. So um, the WHO recommendations for using urine uh, say that maintain one month at 20 degrees C. Um, I'm not good enough to know exactly what that is in Fahrenheit, but you can figure it out. One month, and, uh, and you can use it on processed food crops or um, fodder, animal feed. Uh, six months at 20 degrees C um, almost ensures complete and total pathogen kill. Um, so by their recommendations, what you can do is apply urine uh, on all food crops um, and uh, for certain food crops that are grown above ground, especially things like lettuce, um, pretty much everybody recommends uh, not applying within a month of eating. Uh, I do want to be very clear here. Urine is not uh, legal. And this is, this was something that I, I really tried to research and really couldn't find a definitive answer on, but um, you know, you don't uh, apply urine to uh, produce that you're going to sell. Uh, WHO says, um, you know, use urine on produce, uh, you know, that you're going to eat. Well, sorry, not WHO. I don't want to put words in, in their mouth. But um, a lot of the um, literature out there says, you know, use urine on uh, crops that you're going to produce and eat within your own household. Uh, if you do want to share with neighbors, um, obviously make sure that they know that um you and that they're okay with you growing food with your urine um again uh uh these bottles oh you know one last thing about these bottles was um remember the shrewbite now if you're going to age urine you are going to end up with a little bit of sludge here now before you apply it what i like about these small bottles they're only a gallon and i could pick them up and shake them real good and put that shrewbite back in suspension before um before applying uh, Rich Earth Institute, I shamelessly grabbed a screenshot from a video. Uh, this is their uh, pretty clever collection device that they, I believe they sell them. I know that they offer plans on how to make your own. Uh, and I think they sell them as like a, a donation to the, uh, um, to, to their nonprofit, um, which of course I, I uh, adamantly would encourage you to donate to Rich Earth here. Um, uh, I, I really have shamelessly drawn a lot of 
work for them. Um, okay, so what he's basically done, what's unique about this is he's got this funnel, but what's pretty cool is that there's, um, at the bottom of that funnel, right before your urine goes into that jug, um, he puts a ping pong ball that uh, effectively serves as a check valve. You can, you can urinate into the funnel and your urine will go underneath the ping pong ball, but then the ping pong ball will, will settle back down over the funnel and prevent gases from escaping out. Okay, so this is maybe a little bit more of a smell-free experience than what I do, um, basically just urinating into those jugs. Um, I will say that I also keep, um, I keep five-gallon buckets around. That's wildly convenient for me. And, uh, and I find that five-gallon buckets with an airtight seal is a really nice way for, for collecting bulk amounts of urine. Uh, I would not personally want to get into a scenario where I've collected urine in a container, and I've seen many people that have done this, but um, again, I, I would advise against, um, if this is your first time thinking about fertilizing with urine, uh, really putting it in any kind of container that you can't pick up on your own and handle. I, I would hate to have a 50-gallon drum of urine that I can't use. <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, here you go. This is Rich Earth Institute, and um, you know they do this um, this personal collection. They also have a community collection program um, where they've gotten permits from the state that allow them to um, apply urine on pastures and do research and whatnot. There, at their large scale, they don't age their urine; um, they pasteurize it. Here are those guidelines from the WHO that I um, had mentioned earlier. Um, I'll leave this up, you can read that. Um, food and fodder crops that are to be processed. Um, uh, notice the lower temperature. They're not requiring virus kill there, okay? Um, fodder crops, unprocessed fodder crops, you can still get away with that low temperature, but you do need that long storage. Um, higher temperatures mean you can reduce your storage time. Uh, my urine, what I actually do is, um, uh, certainly any urine that I collect at the farm. Um, I, I store it in the um, solar biochar heated kiln that we have. Um, and of course it gets very hot in there. It's, uh, you know, in most of the summer it can be up around 100 degrees all the, or, you know, during the day. So that's great. Mm -hmm.